You know, perception is an interesting thing. Uh, the Bible teaches us really two important things about how we perceive situations. Number one is this. The way that you perceive a situation very much affects how you feel about that situation. Have you experienced that to be true? The way that you perceive something to be very much affects the way that you feel about that thing. But the other thing that's important to keep in mind, number two, is that we do not always perceive situations correctly. And what this means is sometimes we can be very convinced that things are a certain way and we can actually be wrong. But it definitely, the way that we're convinced, the way that we perceive it to be, very much affects the way that we feel about it. A dictionary defines turning the tables, which is the title of our teaching today. The dictionary defines that phrase as an idiom, which means to reverse a situation. And today what I'd like to talk about, what I'd like to expound on is the idea of turning the tables and reversing situations. And I'd like to think a little bit about how that applies to our perception of things. Because what we see in our text today is that oftentimes it's our perception of a situation that needs to be changed, not the situation itself necessarily. I'll say that again. What we see here in the life of Joseph that we need to also apply to our lives is that oftentimes it's our perception of a situation that needs to be changed, not necessarily the situation itself. Maybe you're familiar with the story. Jesus had been ministering publicly for about three years at this point. Most of his ministry had been done in the north of Israel, in the region of Galilee. But finally, this man, Jesus Christ, of, of whom many said that he was the Messiah, the one that they had been waiting for, for generations, for even thousands of years, the promised Savior of the world, the one who would come as the Messiah and set them free from oppression, the one who would sit upon the throne of David and establish the kingdom of David that would have no end. Finally, this Jesus is coming to Jerusalem, the city of David, the religious center of Israel, the political center of Israel. Oh, this Jesus, he had been to, he had been to Jerusalem before. This wasn't his first time, but this time was very different. Before, when Jesus had come, he was somewhat of an obscure figure. He was a lot more unknown, but this time is different. Jesus has now been ministering for three years. News about him has spread throughout all of Israel, even beyond the borders of Israel. How he healed the sick, how he performed miracles, how he taught people about the kingdom of God, how he declared forgiveness of sins with authority. How he was opposed to the hypocrisy of the, the religious establishment of that day, how he taught the pure way of God. And so Jesus, uh, he enters Jerusalem, and now this time people know who he is. The news that he's coming to Jerusalem, it's spread throughout all the country and, and the whole city, even people from the countryside, they come out to welcome Jesus. And as Jesus enters the city, he enters in riding on a donkey, and in doing that, what he's doing is he's tapping into an Old Testament prophecy and declaring himself to, in fact, be the Messiah. And the people welcome him as the Messiah. They say, blessed are you who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed are you, son of David. They say, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they, they set out these palm branches. That's why we call it Palm Sunday, because they laid out these palm branches as kind of a, a red carpet to make a way for Jesus to come into the city triumphantly as king, as Messiah, as the, the rightful king, oh, to come in and overthrow these occupying forces that were established there in the city. You know, up on the Temple Mount, there was the the fortress where the Roman cohort was based. It was called the Antonia Fortress. And it actually was right next to the wall of the temple. If you ever look at a map of the old city of Jerusalem, you'll see there's the, the temple courts with its walls. And then totally adjacent to one of the walls is this fortress. And that was the headquarters for the Roman troops in Jerusalem. So this is Sunday. Jesus goes to sleep on Sunday night with the whole city of Jerusalem waiting with bated breath to see what's going to happen the next day. 
And again, remember this Antonia fortress, it's up there on the Temple Mount. So on Monday, what happens? Jesus wakes up and he starts making his way up the hill. He makes his way up to the Temple Mount. Now, again, you have to understand the anticipation and the hope that was in the hearts and the minds of the whole city of Jerusalem, if not the whole nation of Israel. They're thinking as Jesus is walking into Jerusalem, as he's walking up this hill, they're thinking, is this it? Is this the moment we've been waiting for for so many years? When the Messiah will come up on the Temple Mount and he will overthrow the occupying forces, is this it? They're thinking, I cannot believe it's finally here. It's finally here. Can you believe it? And up the road he goes, and you got to see this, that there would be a, an entire crowd of people following him. And this would be a growing crowd. This would be the kind of thing where people look out their windows and they see a crowd and they, they run to join and be part of the action. But by the time Jesus gets up to the Temple Mount, there are probably hundreds if not thousands of people gathered around him. There are young men with all their zeal ready to go in and fight and take back their country from these Roman oppressors, occupiers. People are thinking, you know, oh my, this is it. This is what we've been waiting for. God has heard our prayers and he sent us a deliverer. Finally, the Messiah has come. He has the pedigree. He's the descendant of David. He's fulfilled all the prophecies about the Messiah. And he's walking towards the Antonia Fortress to kick out these Romans and take his rightful place on the throne of David. Roman soldiers, you can imagine, they're getting nervous. They're preparing for conflict because here comes this man who who these people believe to be their rightful king, and there's an entire mob of people right behind him. But Jesus, as he arrives at the top of this hill, at the Temple Mount, instead of walking past the temple gates and going to the fortress, he enters the temple courtyard. Thousands of people, they're standing there watching his every move, and what does Jesus do? He does something nobody expected him to do. He grabs the tables of the people who are selling merchandise in the temple courts and he starts dumping their stuff on the floor. And he says to everybody, my father's house is a house of prayer for all nations, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. Jesus turned the tables. And you know, he didn't just turn the tables physically. He did that too, but he turned the tables in every possible sense of the term. Instead of driving out the Romans, Jesus cleansed the temple. You know, this is something nobody expected him to do. In doing this, he absolutely turned the tables. He reversed the situation. I mean, here are all these people standing around watching this. They had come to watch Jesus overthrow the government. Not to, he didn't come to watch him call them to a, a pure and sincere worship of God and, and relationship with God. And these people frankly, were extremely disappointed by this. This is not at all what they had expected that he would do. And as a result, those same crowds who on Palm Sunday were chanting and gathering around saying, Hosanna, only a few days later, four or five days later, on Good Friday, what are they chanting now? Crucify him. Same people, same crowds. And Jesus was crucified. But little did these people know that that actually that was the very reason why Jesus had come to Jerusalem in the first place, to be crucified. They couldn't have possibly understood it in the moment, but in fact, by placing that crown of thorns on Jesus' head, rather than the crown of David, which the people had wanted to put on his head, they were actually fulfilling the very purpose of God for their own salvation. Do you realize that? Talk about turning the tables in every sense of the word. Again, turning the tables, it's an idiom. It means to reverse a situation. And Jesus turned the tables in every sense when he entered the temple that day and turned over the tables of the merchants. He turned the tables on what people thought of him and what they expected of him. He turned the tables even on his own future, actually. Rather than the throne, he went to the cross. And in doing so, he turned the tables for us as well. Because although we, and actually all of us really, by our sin, we put him on that cross. It was through his death on the cross that we can have life. He turned the tables. Eternal life, abundant life through his death. He died in our place for our sins. He died that we might live. 
You know, it's really hard to emphasize, it's hard to overemphasize what a significant event this was in Jesus' life and ministry. When he walks into the temple and he turns the tables. It really did change everything in that moment. We often overlook it, I think, as, as just something that Jesus did, you know, just one of the many things that he did. But really, this event turned the tables in a major way, in many ways. And not only was this a significant event in Jesus' life and ministry, but it's also characteristic of, of who God is and how he works in our lives and in the world. Because the God of the Bible, the true and living God, he's a God who loves to bring about transformation. He is on a mission to save and redeem. And in that mission, he often does things which we would not have expected him to do. He often does things that we might even find uh, very confusing. Just like those people at that time were very confused by why Jesus would turn over the tables in the temple rather than cleansing the city of these Roman occupiers. But just like in that story, many times God is doing something much bigger, much more significant in our lives than what we can perceive in the moment. And it's easy to be like one of these people standing there watching the tables get turned in the temple courtyard and think, this is bad, right? What's happening right now is, is not what I wanted. This is not what I expected that Jesus would do. This is not what I even hoped that he would do. This is bad. When in reality, even though they didn't realize it yet, even though sometimes we don't realize it, what was happening with the tables being turned was actually the best thing that could possibly happen. Because although Jesus was not doing what they hoped he would do, he was doing something much bigger. He was doing something which would ultimately be better for them because it was for their salvation. That's what we call providence. You know, the providence of God is one of the greatest doctrines in the Bible. And God teaches us about his providence, not just by telling us that, yeah, I'm providential, but he actually does it through telling us stories. And one of the greatest stories in the Bible which illustrates the providence of God is the story of Joseph at the end of the book of Genesis, which we have been studying for the past few weeks. Providence means that God rules over all things. Things in your life and in my life and history, they don't just happen by random chance. God determines things. God orchestrates things. God permits things. And that means that God is actively involved in what happens in our lives and in our world. He is actively involved in shaping history. And he is working, the Bible says, he's working all things together. Not only for his glory, but for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purposes. So Joseph's story really is a living example of what providence looks like. Joseph spent the first 17 years of his life as his father's favorite son. He grew up in a wealthy family with lots of siblings. Joseph's dad uh, was a, a wealthy businessman, successful. And Joseph's dad loved him more than any of his other siblings. When Joseph was 17 years old, his dad made him boss over all his older brothers in their family business. And of course, Joseph's brothers weren't very excited about this, that their younger brother was now following them around with a clipboard and taking notes and reporting to dad. And they began to have this kind of um, resentment towards him. And as that resentment grew, it, it, it turned into hatred. And one day when they had the opportunity, they seized Joseph they were planning to kill him, but they decided, hey, well, we could at least make a little bit of money if we sold him as a slave. So they sell him as a slave. He goes into slavery in Egypt. And for the next 13 years of Joseph's life, he is in Egypt, first as a slave and then as a prisoner. Because during the time he was a slave, he got framed for a crime he didn't commit and wrongfully imprisoned. Things are not really going great in his life for those 13 years. Throughout all this, though, Joseph remains this godly man who walks with God and lives a holy life, in spite of the fact that he has no one around him to encourage him in his relationship with God. He has no one around him to encourage him to walk with God, and in spite of the fact that he's constantly faced with temptation. But finally, one day, out of the blue, Joseph gets called out of prison. They give him a shave, they, they give him a shower, and and they tell him, well, we've got this quandary here. The Pharaoh had a dream, and no one can interpret it. And we heard that sometimes you're able to interpret dreams. See, God had given Pharaoh a dream, 
And then God gave Joseph the interpretation of that dream. God had providentially orchestrated the whole thing. Joseph was in just the right place at just the right time with just the right skills and it was not at all by chance. And the point of this dream that God gave Pharaoh was that the next seven years there would just be this unparalleled abundance and plenty. The, the harvest would be good, the land would produce like crazy, but then they would be followed by seven years of unprecedented drought and famine that would be so great it was totally overshadow the seven years of plenty. And so Pharaoh is so impressed by Joseph that not only does he let Joseph out of jail, but he gives Joseph a job. He appoints him to be the guy in charge of the food, to store up food during the years of plenty and to distribute food during the years of famine. And that's where we picked up our story today in chapter 41 and 42. The famine that God said would come has come. And it's so bad in the land of Canaan. It's so bad that Jacob and his sons are now flat broke. Whereas before they had this, you know, uh, business that seemed to be doing well. They had land and they had animals. Well, it seems that now they've got no more food. They've eaten all their animals and now they're hungry. And I love this line at the beginning of chapter 42. It says, Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt. And he said to his sons, why do you just sit there looking at each other, right? Apparently, they've eaten all the animals. And now they're out of food. And they're just sitting around in their living room like just these dudes, you know. And they're like, man, I'm hungry. Yeah, are you hungry? Yeah, I'm totally hungry. Man, I could go for a cheeseburger. Me too, man. Yeah, I'm hungry. And then dad comes in and he's like, why are you guys just sitting there staring at each other having this redneck conversation? Just go out and get some food. There's food in Egypt. Go get it. You know, have you ever met this guy before? The guy who's like sitting on the couch and he's like, I'm hungry. But I don't want to go and get the food because it's all the way over there in the refrigerator and the thing's kind of hard to open. I've met that guy before. I, probably you have too. So the ten brothers, they, they go down to Egypt to buy some food because that's the only place where there is food because God spoke to Joseph and told him to save up during the years of plenty so they would have food in the years of famine. In Genesis chapter 12, God had spoken to Abraham. Now Abraham is, is Joseph's great-grandfather, right? And he made Abraham some promises. God told Abraham, Abe, if you will take my hand and you will walk with me by faith and you will believe my promises, then I will bless you beyond your wildest imagination. I have plans for you, Abraham, bigger plans than you can even imagine. And if you will walk with me, then I will bless you and I will make your name great. And I will make you a great nation with more descendants than there is sand on the seashore, more descendants than there are stars in the sky. And he says this, and in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now that promise, that, that's a promise that, of course, ultimately finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, who is also a descendant of Abraham. But the first time that promise is fulfilled is here at the end of Genesis in the person of Joseph. Because we read in chapter 41, verse 57, it says, All the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all the earth. Now, think about this. This is interesting because the first fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through his descendants, it comes through Joseph. Now, who is Joseph? Is, is he a preacher? Is he a prophet? No. But what he is, is he's a very godly man who's very good at business, who's very savvy at business. And he's a high-ranking government official in Egypt. And this man uses his power and influence that he has as being part of this government in Egypt. He uses it to fulfill the purposes of God and to bless the whole world. Isn't that interesting? You know, here, here's the very important truth that we can learn from this. You can be effective for God's kingdom using whatever skills God has given you if you will just commit them to him. You know, after high school, I had this job where, uh, in the summer where I worked in this warehouse, this furniture warehouse. And, uh, and on my bathroom mirror, every day before I went to work, I had put this sticky note up so that I would see it every day. And it said this, it's from Colossians 3.23. It says, whatever you do, 
Work at it with all your heart as for the Lord and not for men. And every day I went to work at that warehouse, my goal was to serve God. And I need to tell you that that warehouse was a very fruitful mission field. God was at work in that place. Ministry happened in that place every single day. You know, we are somehow conditioned to think that if you really want to be effective for the kingdom of God, then the only way to do it is to quit whatever job you're doing and become a pastor or a preacher, right? If you would go in, if you would see a book on our table, there isn't one back there, but if you would see a book on our table that says uh, the man whom God uses or the woman who God uses, you would probably assume that this is a book about a missionary or a pastor, but look at the man who God uses here. This is a, a businessman. This is a government official who's using his skills and his power and his influence to do the purposes of God, to fulfill the will of God, to be a blessing to all nations. So I would encourage you, whatever occupation you're in, whether it's business, whether you're teaching, whatever it is that you're doing, do it unto the glory of God. Let God accomplish his kingdom purposes through you in that place, even through your work. So the brothers go to Egypt to buy grain and they meet Joseph because Joseph's the guy in charge of the food. And Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. It's been over 20 years now. It's been a long time. And Joseph understands what they're saying because Joseph still speaks Hebrew. They don't realize it, of course, because he's speaking to them through a translator. And Joseph starts messing with them. Why? Because he loves them. We're going to talk about that more next week. That if you love somebody, sometimes you mess with them, right? So Joseph loves, loves them and he messes with them. And he wants to see if they've changed over the years. So he accuses them of being spies and he puts them in jail for a few days. And after three days, he lets all of them out except for Simeon. And he tells them they can go back, take their food home to their dad and their little brother. But they have to come and bring back Simeon or they're not getting their brother. Or they have to come back and bring back Benjamin, the youngest, or he's not going to give him back Simeon, who he's holding hostage. So the brothers go back to Jacob with the food that they've bought, but Simeon remains in Egypt kind of as a guarantee that the brothers will return. And when they get home, they realize that their money is still in their sacks. Joseph put their money back in their bags. One, it was to be nice to them, but number two, it was also to mess with them, to freak them out so that they're thinking, oh no, you know, when we go back to Egypt... We're going to be accused of stealing on top of being accused of being spies. They're going to lock us up. We're toast. So they tell Jacob, right, we had to leave Simeon there. And they won't let him go. And they won't give us more food until we bring Benjamin with us. Now Benjamin is Jacob's favorite son. Now that his first favorite son he thinks is dead, uh, he's still playing favorites, right? He's still sinning against his children by playing favorites with them. But because they need food and because Simeon's being held in Egypt, he finally agrees to let Benjamin go. But his final words in, in verse 36 are these. Everything has come against me. In this section, there are three main characters, three main parties involved in the story. We've got Joseph, we've got Joseph's brothers, and we've got Joseph's dad, Jacob. And in each of their lives, what we see is a turning of the tables, a reversal of their situation. Joseph goes from being a prisoner to being prime minister. He goes from being in jail to actually having his own jail. I mean, how cool is that, right? He goes from dirt poor to filthy rich. He goes from powerless to powerful. The brothers, they go from dealers of injustice to recipients of grace. They go from powerful to powerless they go from being merciless to Joseph to being at the mercy of Joseph and Jacob the dad he goes from being wealthy to being completely broke he goes from having 12 sons at home to having no sons at home everybody's situation has been changed the tables have turned but in addition to the tables being turned in their positions in life in their physical circumstances we also see three very important ways in which this story turns the tables on how we perceive the situations they're in 
Again, we see how the tables are turned on how we perceive the situations they're in. As I mentioned at the beginning, two important things to remember about perception that this story and other stories in the Bible teach us. Number one, the way that we perceive a situation to be very much affects the way that we feel about that situation. Number two, we do not always perceive situations correctly. First of all, look at Joseph's perception. Going back to chapter 41, verses 50 to 52. After Joseph becomes prime minister of Egypt, we read that he gets married and he has two sons. The first son is named Manasseh, the second son is named Ephraim. And the meanings of those names tell us a lot about where Jacob is at in his thinking. Manasseh means forget and Ephraim means doubly fruitful. Paul the apostle said this in Philippians chapter 3, he said, this one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Joseph is essentially saying this too. He's saying, I'm letting go of my past. I'm not going to, I'm going to forget what lies behind. I'm not going to live in the past. I'm not going to let the bad things that have been done to me define who I am. I'm not going to let them define who I will be. Rather, I'm going to embrace where God has placed me. And I'm going to be fruitful here. And he says this, The land of my affliction has become the land of my fruitfulness. That's a huge, major change in attitude. The order of these sons' name is so significant. First, forget. And second, fruitful. And and the point for us is this. We will never be fruitful until we quit living in the past. Joseph's making a choice. His his past has indeed been very hard. A lot of very hurtful things have been done to him. He has been the victim of injustice and sin. But rather than holding on to that pain and that hurt and letting it define his life, he's going to make a choice to move on and move forward and let go of his past. And more than that, not only does he do that, but he also embraces the fact that God has providentially brought him to this place at this time, even providentially brought him through hardship. In chapter 44, we read that Joseph finally reveals himself to his brothers and he tells them in in chapter 45, actually, verse 5, he says, Do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God brought me here to preserve life. He said, you know, guys, don't worry about it. I'm not angry because now I realize, I embrace the fact that God is the one who brought me here. See how the tables are turned on Joseph's perception of his situation? Rather than seeing himself as a victim, rather than getting bogged down in self-pity because of his past, he refuses to cling to the past and he embraces where God has him and he determines to be fruitful in that place and be used for God for God's purposes. Next perception I want you to see is the brother's perception in chapter 42. The brothers ask the question, what is this thing that God has done to us? What has God done to us? Look at this. They assume that the bad things happening in their lives, the famine, the the accusations that they're spies and that they're thieves, they assume all these things are the punishment of God upon them, paying them back for the wrong thing that they did to Joseph over 20 years ago, like some kind of divine retribution or karma for the bad things that they've done in the past. How many people do you know who think in the same way? Maybe you're one of them. Maybe you think this way too. But you know what's interesting about this? Is that when we look at the big picture, the whole story, what we see is that their perception of the situation couldn't have been more wrong. It couldn't have been more incorrect because much rather than punishing them for their sins, God, through all these circumstances, is actually providing for their salvation. They think that everything that's happening is punishment Little do they know it's actually provision. Because even though they've sinned, God still loves them. And God just pours out grace upon them. They truly do deserve the punishment which they they know they deserve. But God gives them something they don't deserve. He blesses them. He provides for them. He takes care of them. And he saves them. That is the essence of grace. That's the essence of the gospel, that rather than the punishment that we rightly deserve for the things that we've done, 
God gives us blessing and provision and salvation that we could have never earned or deserved. In fact, I I hope you know this. This is the essence of grace, that, that none of the good things that happen to you in your life, none of the blessings that God gives you have been earned by you. They haven't been merited by you. They aren't the result of you doing the right things and keeping all the rules. In fact, biblically, we'd have to say that it is impossible to coerce God into blessing you by your own works and acts of service because all the blessings of God are only by his grace. You know, and and what that means for us practically is that we don't do things for God so that God will do something for us. Rather, every act of service we do unto the Lord, we do it only as a response to his goodness, only as a response to the fact that God has lavished grace upon us because his blessings can't be earned. All we do is respond to those blessings. And and the things that we do deserve, which are alienation from God and, and punishment for our sins, these things were cast upon Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. That's why he cried out in anguish on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The suffering that that Jesus experienced on the cross was much greater than the physical suffering of being nailed to a tree and hanging there for hours. It was the anguish of the brunt force, of the burden of sin of the world that was cast upon him. It was the alienation from God that we deserve that was cast upon him, that we might be, through him, reconciled to God. The gospel message is that God became a man and absorbed the punishment that we deserve so that if anyone is in Christ, they might be a recipient of grace and not a recipient of wrath. And what that means for you, if you are a believer here today, is that you can know that when bad things happen to you, when your circumstances are bad, that's not God punishing you. Because all the punishment for your sins has already been cast upon Jesus Christ. So your difficult circumstances, if you're a believer, are not God punishing you, but God is rather working all things, even the difficult things, even the trials, even the things that you don't understand, he's working all of it for your good and for his glory if you're called according to his purposes, if you love him. Thirdly, the third perception we're going to look at today is And this is the final one. This is Jacob's perception in chapter 42, verse 36. And and in verse 36, you know, when Jacob gets all this news, he feels that his world is falling apart. He's lost his business. He's lost his wealth. First, he lost his favorite son. Now he's going to lose all of his sons because the Egyptians are going to think that they're thieves and they're all going to end up in jail. And now they're taking the youngest son with him, the only child he has left from his beloved wife, Rachel. And what does he say in his desperation? He says, everything has come against me. Everything is working against me. Do you ever feel that way? That everything that could possibly go wrong is going wrong. Everything is against you. But the reality of the situation is much rather than everything working against Jacob. God is actually working all things together for Jacob. Jacob doesn't know it right now, but in reality, in the past 20 years, God has been working behind the scenes in places where he couldn't see it, providentially to provide for Jacob's salvation, to save Jacob's life, to save his family's life. You know, the one thing that's in common to all these people in this story is that for each of them, what they perceived to be terrible things happening in their lives, although they were indeed, and we cannot discount this, they were indeed difficult and painful things, but they were also the loving hand of God providentially working in their lives, orchestrating events and circumstances for their salvation and for their ultimate good because God loved them. Joseph is already beginning to see that. But the others are going to see it soon as well, too. You know, personally for me, as I read this story, and, and, I, and I hope for you, too, when I read this story, it makes me think about my life, makes me consider the circumstances in my life. And, and of course, today, as I'm talking about perception, it very much makes me think about the perception that I have of the things that are happening to me. 
And maybe, like the people in this story, it isn't my circumstances that need to change. Because God, right, in his providential love, has allowed those circumstances in my life for a purpose. Maybe it's actually my perception of those things that needs to change. And as my perception of those things changes, as, as I bring my perception in line with God's word, I guarantee you that my feelings about those situations are also going to change. My attitude towards those circumstances is going to change as I change my perception and bring my perception in line with God's word. He says that God loves me, that he's providentially working all things in my life for his glory and for my good. Because maybe the circumstance is not a curse like I think it is. Maybe it's actually ordained by God himself for my benefit, for the benefit of others, for the purposes of his kingdom. Maybe God wants to do something bigger than just fix my outward circumstances. Just like God wanted to do something bigger than, than establish an earthly kingdom on the day after Palm Sunday. You know, the day after Palm Sunday, Jesus did something that no one expected him to do. Rather than cleansing the city of Romans, he cleansed the temple of what didn't belong there. Jesus had come to do something bigger than, than what most people hoped he would do even. They hoped he would establish a kingdom in Israel, but he came to do more than that. He came to establish an eternal kingdom. He didn't just come to set people free from Roman oppression. He came to set people free from the bondage and oppression of sin. And in the same way, I believe that Jesus would do the same thing in my life today and in your life today. That rather than coming in and changing our circumstances, rather than driving out the Romans, so to say, rather than fixing our circumstances that we think are the real problems in our lives, he wants to come into the temple of our hearts and clean house there and establish his kingdom there. Rather than fixing our outward circumstances, which we are convinced are the real problem that he needs to come in and fix, his priority is rather to enter the temple our hearts, and get rid of those things which don't belong there. The idolatry, the, the misordered love in our heart, the wrong attitudes, and the question for us today, the question for you is, will you let him do that today? Will you let him do that today? Because here's why. In his providence, he is taking care of your circumstances. But let him also transform your heart let him also transform your attitudes let him also transform your perceptions of your situations and bring them into line with his amen let's stand and pray lord god heavenly father we thank you that you are good that you have good plans for our lives to give us future to give us hope lord we thank you that you are working all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purposes. And Lord, we ask that it, if there are areas in our lives where it isn't our situation, our circumstances that need to be changed, but it's our perception of those things, Lord, I pray that you would do that. Lord, if we're like those people on, on the day after Palm Sunday expecting you to come in and fix what we perceive to be the true problem, Lord, I pray that you would come into the temple of our hearts and that you would establish your kingdom there and clean house there. Lord, thank you that you know better than us. Lord, that your ways are higher than ours, that your knowledge is greater than ours. And Lord, thank you that we can entrust our lives fully into your hands. And right now, Lord, I pray for anyone who's here today who has not yet given their life to you, who has not yet put their trust and their hope in Jesus Christ fully for their salvation, for their righteousness. Lord, if there's anyone here today who has yet to make that decision and put their faith in you and become a disciple of Jesus Christ, Lord, would you work in their hearts right at this moment and bring about that change, that they might be born again to new life and abundant life in you. They might become the children of God. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.